pass. 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 Welcome back. Day 14. Baby cognitive modeling. <laughs> where I go through all the exercises in baby cognitive modeling in order to learn how to do a baby and inference. And we're at a proud moment today. We have made it through all of the initial sections where I've gone through how to do estimation. I've learned how to do some testing, generally how to go about doing some predictive checks, and I hope to get a little more experience with some of the diagnostics in the Kevin Cummins section, but we've gotten to the case studies, so that's exciting. I have not looked at any of the case study material in advance. Uh, um, part of that has just been um, not being able to do enough sufficient prep work, but part of that is because me being on the live stream is me practicing it's just practicing live so this is sort of what i would be doing uh, study wise anyway just to sort of talking out loud i have ice cream today also a bay compliments from my roommate so we're gonna get started like i said we've made it through understanding some of the basic principles you know how do we combine information um, from the prior distribution and the likelihood in order to um, update our uncertainties about the distributions for parameters of interest as per specified from within our likelihood function and we do so this process is done um, or the process of making a likelihood into a probability distribution um, involves the marginal likelihood and which in some cases can be analytically intractable so we use a sampling approach markov chain Monte Carlo in our case um, we're using JAGS which is a Gibbs sampler um, and uh, we do it in R so there's all the pieces up to this point. We've done parameter estimation um, where we've specified models inferring both binomial and Gaussian processes, looking at how do we reparameterize models in order to get more um, conventional statistics that we've seen in the past. How do we use uh, these sorts of models in order to infer uh, latent groups? So as well as uh, infer missing values, which I think is pretty cool too. And then how can we take this information and use it to then test hypotheses where we have, we want to compare models against one another and we don't necessarily only want the information from the posterior distributions, but we want to compare that information and see uh, um, how it fares with respect to other information, such as a, a some sort of null hypothesis. And we can compare um, models across hypotheses, um, otherwise known as t-tests um, in our standard, what we would identify them as. Um, and you know, once we can can compare g Gaussian and binomial rates, so these discrete and continuous uh, uh, data, then you know we have the tools to move to more complex and applied examples. Um, most cases are going to be, I presume, some combination of all of the things that we've approached up to this point. So I look forward to get started with each one of these 19 examples uh, we have in the case study section. I'm going to get right into it today with the memory retention example, and it looks like memory retention is something we've sort of discussed when we were doing some of the latent mixture um, examples, but we'll see what they talk about in the chapter. And I'm also going to take a bite of ice cream once I get to the page because it's going to melt and 
I'm gonna eat the whole tub on the stream today. <laughs> I look forward to that. Okay, where are we? Oh, just a note. I also asked my professor about the the use of angles in order to get z a z exact estimates of the order restriction in order to t uh, use for hypothesis testing. And he, he also didn't have a, a sense or he couldn't um, get a sense from just looking at the code. He's very much a math guy and he wishes that they would have just showed the, the formulas here and then he would have been able to give me a better sense. But he bought, he bought into the in intuition that there could be some inflated amount of uh, zeros using the approximate method and that this somehow alleviated that. Though, um, wasn't sure or couldn't um, quickly at least walk me through how this, this probit distribution here um, alleviates this problem. Anyway, so that's the update on that. Nothing. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So here. So from the beginning of time, <laughs> great, great start to case studies. But this is a in cognitive psychology. Understanding how we retain memories has been a, a very common issue. It looks like that's what it wants to describe. All the way back to the guy who wrote down all those numbers, like did that self experiment where he tried to record memory retention and then observe memory decay um, introspectively. Awesome guy. Uh, patient man but so uh, the common experiments then and then we have mathematical so it describes the common experiments here which people list items and test their ability to remember items and then people have described various mathematical functions uh, in order to understand the relationships between time so the decay of memory, right, and retention. So time and retention. So we have an exponential decay model is a um, very simplified model we can start with. It looks like we will start with here. This is the exponential decay model. And we're going to have, we're going to use fictitious data still. So while we're using a real cognitive um, process that people are interested in that being memory attention we're still using fictitious data but at least for this first case so let's build up some intuition about this we got four subjects or we have one subject we have no data so you know what we did last time with that latent mixture approach you can imagine we're probably going to be able to infer the scores at each one of these time intervals given our theorized um, exponential decay function here. So that's to come. We're also going to be able to predict how, um, given knowledge about the scores in the first 99, I'll go in seconds right now. Um, sure, 99 seconds. At the 200th. What will we predict? Okay, four, five, five. Okay. hundreds functions as to generalize our measurement equation. Let's take a look at the model. So we have uninformative priors for alpha beta, which are representative of theta. So I 
I don't know what this minimum is. But I I haven't seen minimum yet, but I presume it means that we're minimizing this function. Mm -hmm. And that time So we're changing at some rate over time, plus the beta. So there's some value, and then we have an exponential change here. Okay. And then of course we have a binomial distribution for k because it's modeling success rates. We can look at the plates here. So we have people within time. So we have measurements across time. And then on all measurements across time, we have people at a given time point. And this is the successful retention of a thing. I don't know what they're capturing here, but it's for successful retention of something for a given person, I, at time point J. And we have information about time J. So with given both information about time j here, so theta at a given time point, um, so s the success rate for a given individual at a given time point is distributed as a binomial distribution with theta for a given time point um, for the amount of trials. So everyone has the same amount of trials, right? And okay. Yep. Let's see, the graphical model, how does this account for data showing up? Really? Oh yeah, so it does. So we see here that every subject I is going to have the same decay curve at time point J. Hmm. So we're not accounting for potential individual variation in the memory retention curves um, across subjects. Let's open up the code. Case studies, I will say we're in memory retention, and I will set the open directory. Put the working directory here, and then let's see, we're opening up retention again. So the for each for each subject at each time point. Let k um, sub for a given subject at a given time point be binomial and distributed with some exponential decay rate um, represented by theta for a given person for a given time point. And however, across subjects, it's the same here, right? Because we're going to get, oh, we're also going to do a predictive model here. So prediction for k then. I for a given person is that. So here, and then we'll do prediction as well. And then retention at each lag for subjects K. Right, so here we're just modeling theta then for the theta we just grabbed here. For a given subject at a given time point, we have theta sub ij, which is min. I don't know what min is. I'm going to look up min. Uh, I'll Google it.
So Min and Max work just like R. Uh -huh. That means that we need a Min here. So we're looking for the min, so it's at least one. Um, so we're looking for the minimum value of this expression here. That's at least one. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go. library memory scores length of the memory scores s list hmm. what is this subject list subjects one through four and then we get the number of subjects as four we're gonna make a matrix here where the rows are equal to the number of subjects columns are the number of time points and we divide by one this is true so this gives us k here, which is a matrix representation of the table we saw. And now N. Hmm. Oh, N is the number of memory retention questions. We're going to assume 18 is the perfect score. And then, excuse me, and then anything below 18 is not a perfect score. Right. Where do we use n for? Yep, n is used here in our binary view. So we need that value so we can specify the data and then we initialize alpha and beta for our chain. And we need to do so, it looks like we need to initialize for each of the subjects. So each subject gets an initialization of a alpha and beta. Mm. And this is sort of a redundancy at this point, but in part because we're not modeling individual variation yet across the subjects. But sample, mm, beautiful. We get predictions for each of the time points for each of the subjects. Hmm. Better. 
Here are the decay rates for each of the subjects. Higher indicates um, more quickly. Higher indicates a faster rate of memory loss or a faster decay of memory. Um, I infer this in part because directionally speaking, if you take a look at the subject scores here, this subject scores the best and kind of goes down. This subject is not scoring too hot in the first place and then kind of evens out. So you can imagine then that having a rate like this is kind of representative of this sort of decay rate that we're seeing here. While alpha 4 is sort of in the middle, it looks like. Beta is like that starting memory value, I guess you could say. Like some people are just better at remembering than others, but it looks like we have baselines equivalent, and then this person is, oh, maybe that's not what beta means. Let's not overstate here. Interestingly enough, let's take a look at the predictions for the fourth subject for the first activation was 16, so that's like the average. So between 14 and 18. So this is how the variability surrounding the fourth person's um, estimate is larger than the first person, for example. And that is reflective of our confidence in this estimation, in part because we were not given any information here. The data didn't tell us anything. The data. Okay. So you can think of um, the baseline and then the Subject. Hmm. My thing is, you can just run frequency statistics on this stuff, right? So. And then give me from the bugs output. It's equivalent of all the alphas and all the betas here. And I modeled it on an alpha here and then beta here. And it gives me some alpha then. And it'll be all my samples from posterior across the chain, the subjects, and then beta. So I can take these posteriors and then I can do the graph, right? Plot. I think this is what I was doing before. Oh. All over the place. 
all possible values of the pistol area. And then we have thicker distributions here. They plot since I'm clearly not plotting the right thing. Let's see, they pull the samples for each subject and then they calculate density for each of the beta distributions. Here's the kernel density estimation for each one. Layout. Scatter. Where's my scatter? Mm. I want this. But what does this do? So give me ten thousand iterations and keep five hundred. And then give me a random so randomly sample 10,000 and then keep, uh, so I'll get 500 values here, right? Yep. And now that's what gets plotted here. So just, I'm getting a random sample, so it's easier to look at, right? And then let's see, which does this become this? This is what I got originally when I sampled it. When I did that plot between all the samples for alpha and beta, I got this blue sort of thing with these dark clusters. But now we have some coloration to represent every subject. So for example, for subject four, we have these sort of diffuse representations for alpha and beta and part of that is just to represent the uncertainty we have regarding the estimates that we um, that we approximated for that subject uh, because we didn't have any information about the other subjects 
However, for the subjects we did have the information, uh, as shown here in black, red and green, see there is a relationship between the two so this is the beta's baseline on average people tend to have the same baseline values as shown here all the distributions and the baseline values uh, don't aren't diffuse as diffuse uh, so a low value of retain memory retention right I think that's what that's saying and then Having a high value here would indicate mm, this is equivalent to what's um, this one. A large memory retention decay memory decay so diffuse large diffuse so larger memory decay though at similar baseline values and then low memory decay um, here but at the same baseline value so something about this individual uh, is showing they have this ability to remember things uh, i think is the point there and here we go is one subject this is the subject in black represented i think The marginal show the distributions for each parameter, right? Clear from the joint posterior. Clear. Carries more information than each of the marginal distributions. Right, so just seeing this and seeing this isn't as informative as seeing both of these in the context of the interpretation of the parameters. So the differences between the decay rates mean are more informative when we have some understanding about the rates of baseline distributions for memory uh, retention here in this case. Right. Mild relationship, larger values of A corresponding to larger values of B, so a positive relationship. are the looks like the predictive shown here. So we're not really sure if large rates correspond to a higher baseline in memory retention. So what we see here is for subject two, we're getting a pretty good uh, predictive curve. Um, subject one, we're missing um, them not so good here and then no curve here. One and three gives little posterior mass to the observed data at many of the time periods. So given that we've observed an inadequacy with our model, now we can move to incorporating individual differences um, with respect to subject variability in memory retention. Um, and in order to do so, we just extend this plate here where 
we still have the same amount of subjects, but now, and everyone's still constrained to the same time points, but now we're gonna have baseline and rates of decay for given subject. Um, and the model doesn't change here. The only thing that changes in effect is this um, extension to now theta being represented at k in addition, or sorry, at to i in addition to j. So why is the posterior predictive distribution for all four subjects the same? Are there any real or fabricated data that would make the model predict different patterns of retention for different subjects? What if we were to make massive qualitative differences, such as one subject remembering everything? Oh, that's interesting. That's why I was seeing this. I was interpreting retention. That's why. I saw this graph, not the other graph. Sick. <laughs> <laughs> but the interpretation still stands here. predictive curves. So this makes more sense here now but relative to what I was <laughs> interpreting before. Um, and I didn't catch is that in text model one, all of our successes are summarized here at IJ, yet IJ is the same for all subjects. Shown here. here hmm. so because these don't have eyes right it's not doing this yep eyes mm -hmm. so why are the predictions the same We still, even if there were qualitative, substantially qualitative or massive qualitative differences in the scoring across subjects for retention model one, we're not capturing individual variation. It's just going to alter the average across subjects still. So this is the reason why even for subject four, when we have no observations, we can s we're still predicting at time point one the same score. You can see how these scores don't correspond nicely or don't correspond well with the actual scores that, that we observed. Um, so in order to have 
different scores across subjects, we need to have individual alpha, uh, baselines and uh, decays. Um, unless it wouldn't matter how I change these scores. You know, I could have someone off across the board get perfects, and all that would do would change how everyone did rather than how uh, that particular individual did. So nothing. So now let's take a look at the full individual differences model. And this is what we were just looking at with the colorations being representative in, well, in this case, with the shapes being representative of each given subject. And then this being the predictions for each subject. So notice how here, let's see, let's see, ch -ch -ch, this sort of, but now that we're accounting for information at the subject level, notice how diffuse our predictive uh, predictions are for subject four, who we didn't have any observations for. Uh, for this, this is looking much better across subjects. Um, yes. Now we have different decay rates across subjects, which is great. I'm clearly showing here. Mm -hmm. Different decay rate for each subject. Mm -hmm. So now we can predict at a given time point what is going to be the um, retention count with 18 being the maximum. Mm -hmm. You can see in this sort of spacing up here is representative. The difference in the spacing up here is representative of the rates of decay in a lot of ways other than, the, I mean, the clear trajectory of these uh, lines as well, but Notice how the subject who we knew got a lot right is a smaller avenue of um, probab probability of counts being higher. So, so let me say that again, where for subject three, notice how there's a larger white space here, and that's because there's a close to zero, if not zero, probability that they got uh, or retained memory scores of this uh, rate at this height so you know, perfect scores are not possible for this subject this far into the game and this is the predictions for each subject's next score end up uh, being around the same we can take a look at that actually Take a look at the time point 10 for each of the subjects. So for these three subjects, there's a prediction that around four items, so this is sort of 
minimum threshold of decay um, at this individual's particular at these individuals particular baseline values. However, the prediction for the fourth subject, for which we have no information, notice how different it is with respect to the other subjects. And yet, um, and also in addition that the, the variability surrounding this uh, estimate of posterior distribution for the prediction for subject four at 10.10 is ex quite large, uh, including, in fact, all possible values. Um, so basically, not being uh, a prediction at all, a good prediction at all, you know, because like 95% credible interval includes um, 0 to 18. You know, so we don't have any um, information for subject 4. That's the point. So weakness in the current model, so we, we still have weaknesses here. So we were able to account for individual differences, but now um, our model just gives us poor predictions for subject four. But I mean, part of that, right, is never going to be, uh, we're never gonna be able to completely fix that. You can't just not have any data on a subject and expect to be able to give very precise and accurate pr predictions about how they would behave on the basis of how other individuals perform and how the average individual performs. Um, I mean, we do that to an extent here, but we're really stretching. <laughs> so, right, the relationship between the priors, parameters for subjects, not formally captured by the model. Right, so subject four is heavily reliant on priors, which are uninformative, so thus the subject four is uninformative. So if we had uh, more informative priors, um, that could lead to uh, an estimate that was more spot on for subject four, but yet would still be reliant on the priors. The priors it just would be informative uh, on the basis of the priors. So this makes it so that we're failing generalizability tests um, because we can't make a sensible prediction on subjects beyond those of what we s observed in the data, right? So this is this sort of predictive check is also I mean, something we do or is done a lot in the realm of machine learning. Um, so if you kind of extrapolated beyond this, you can imagine subject four as being a case of poor outside or test data, um, out of sample testing, right? So we observe data on these subjects, but our model um, fails to generalize beyond what the data we observed um, as reflected in the predictions that we make for subject four with all possible values, with th some cases, all possible values being um, uniformly likely uh, for a given retention count for this subject. Intuitively, one might want to predict subject four has parameters that are consistent with the averages that we um, saw in one, two, and three. And that makes sense, and that's something that I would have actually already expected to be happening, though it, mm, it's not something that we directly encoded into our model at this given point, because we did... We use Bayes rules on each subject here, right? So what I'm thinking it wants us to do next is sort of build a hierarchical structure where we can have individual values for alpha and beta, though these values for a given subject are derived from a omnibus distribution to which can help inform subjects where we don't have a lot of information. So it's this sharing of information across parameters within the model, um, uh, which this, from what I'm guessing and what it just said, it's not doing. Uh, this model is, is just isn't doing that. Um, so, but we can incorporate that into the model and we will do so using structured individual differences here in the third section. Uh, so 
that's the sort of natural um, the logic we're going through here okay a graphical model implemented by 10.7 so let's see what they're doing huh. so here you go same model as before but now okay addition to the individual subjects decay rates and baselines let me also have information about the average decay rate and precision for each of the um, for baseline and the decay rate so now I'm gonna have information about well what's the average for subject and this information then bolsters or helps inform estimates for subjects. that's all it takes just add a structure like this so now we are essentially doing a, a random effects here where we have fixed effects for the decay and the baseline and now we have random effects for each of them where we have values for each subject and this is that sharing of information right across scale Also, I'm listening to music today, um, and I'm not sharing. <laughs> I have the sort of chill music going on in the background. I am listening to basically like house bass trap. The playlist is called Bops. <laughs> but, um, yeah. That's beside the point. So let's once again take a look here. Notice uh, there's also seems to be differences in the text file or differences in the parameterization uh, across WinBugs and JAGS here where the text file specifically for the third data set or third example is going to be different. So let's find out why that's the case. That's why. So notice, if you look, and we've discussed this before, that WinBugs and JAGs use a slightly different syntax when informing constrained distributions, with WinBugs using I as a way to represent the constraint of a distribution, and JAGs, in our case, using T. And here, we constrain the distribution to be nothing below zero, which corresponds, which makes sense because we're talking about decay and um, baseline. So everyone's gonna have some value and that can be up to infinite. And 
That's the only difference is between the two codes. So it's just the representation of the uh, constraints on the intervals. It's from this. Look at how much better. Like if you looked at this distribution of the uniform, or when subject four is posterior was reliant on the only the prior, it's diffuse. But now that we've shared information and subject four is more representative of just the average uh, for baseline and uh, decay rate across these subjects, very nice. How did we go about extending that in the code? It's the next question I would ask. And we can just look at two to three and just do this sort of back and forth. Three, here's two, here's three, here's two, here's three. So nothing in terms of changing the structure of the data that we observe, but we're adding additional parameters um, for jags and the jag here. So here we're just adding more priors and parameterizations. So before we have the priors and then we have information for each subject and we're getting a theta for each subject but now we're going to model the distribution for alpha and beta rather than just assuming prior distributions for alpha and beta so alpha and beta now for a given subject are represented by or distributed normally with alpha and beta so now we're going to set priors for the parameters f for the Gaussian distribution here and have the interval restricted so that we get uh, positive values. And then we have to specify uninformative priors within uh, each of these um, fixed effect distributions for alpha and beta that we specified across. Right, right. And fairly uninformative here where we have beta 1, 1, gamma, this is considered an uninformative prior. And then we do the sigma trick because we have to tell Jags using precision. But it's interpretation sake, we want sigma, right? So this is the difference and we just ran this. So let me look at the distributions here. So here we go. The lowest decay rate here. The largest amount of variability in the curve for subject four. So all making sense. Baselines around the same. So very average baseline. And here we have the predictions across subjects and we have the predictions for this last estimates and the variability has decreased substantially now where we have this interval where most subjects aren't going to have a value above half, right? So over 200 milliseconds we can be 200 seconds, whatever the time interval is, we can be certain that subjects will um, retain less than half of the, just about less than half. Do anything in here? Nope. We pull the same. Let's just 
This is just visualization code. good prediction of subject one. So not only did we improve prediction across each of the subjects by modeling a uh, Gaussian distribution, we also just have better predictions in terms of subject four there. It looks like after the third time point, people tend to start treading off substantially. So the, it's a hierarchical model here. It says that predictions remain useful for the first two subjects and now are also appropriate for out of sample predictions. Hmm. Psychologically. Hierarchical models are powerful because they are able to represent knowledge at different levels of abstraction, right? So that makes sense. Here where we're able to represent what are the average um, scores for each of these parameters and then what is the scores for a subject. So here we have decay and baseline parameters combining to represent some memory process. So here we've uh, been able to combine a theory of memory retention with a theory of individual differences. Interesting. And this gives us a more complete account of the behavioral data across a variety of subjects, even when we don't have um, information about a subject. And that's pretty cool. And it almost seems simpler than if though some of you are familiar with some of the linear mixed effects models. This almost seems just as simple uh, or even uh, more intuitive uh, than doing this in a frequent dispute uh, framework. Where in frequent dis framework we'd be looking at, or I'd model that you could model this as a Poisson, you could model this as. Yeah, it's probably pos Poisson uh, over time. So you could do a longitudinal uh, model or generalized mo um, generalized mixed effects model here, modeling count data uh, distributed over time. And you'd have some average represented by beta 1 or alpha. Uh, so the parameterization would switch up a little bit, but you'd still end up having some representation of the average score and the rate of change across time. Uh, and you could then also um, do random effects uh, for intercept term and slope term. So that would be the equivalent of what we would do in a linear hierarchical model or hierarchical regression in this case. But notice how in that case, we don't get this nice representation of the uncertainty surrounding um, each of the estimations at a given time point. Yeah, we would have prediction curves for each of the subjects. We'd have some standard error and some confidence intervals, but those aren't posterior distributions and they can't be represented or interpreted in, in the same way. Yeah, so we could make prediction then still. 
Think of a psychological model and data in a different context from the current memory retention example where a hierarchical approach might be useful. I can tell you right off the bat, I'm currently um, interested in learning about a structure known as, um, or a process known as drift diffusion models. And I'm just gonna pull up my Zotera here. Zotera is how I keep references. I don't mind my reference structure right now, but here are some of the readings that I've been more or less interested in the past couple weeks. Lee has some, one of the authors of this book. Nothing? Hmm. Which page? I want to show you guys a, a distribution or a schematic for a process that I'm interested in right now. Mm, nope. we go so here's what a drift diffusion model looks like radcliffe's drift diffusion model where we're interested in understanding the rate of uh, evidence accumulation across two responses here and we believe that this uh, accumulation of information can be represented as this stochastic um, accumulation of evidence right where we have boundaries between the two responses and we have this non-decision period as well as a bias towards um, one response or the other so this can all be represented in four parameters here that ten could be like tv uh, za or sometimes it's like bt bt a v whatever ultimately we have this distribution that is characterized by four parameters that is theoretically informative Winer distribution, and why is this particularly relevant to hierarchical models is that, well, you can imagine doing something like this here, where we're representing um, across conditions, across stimulus, and across trials, information uh, from the three parameters, or four parameters that I just spoke about, where we have information about the drift rate, information about um, the boundary conditions um, and we have information about the non-decision um, time and bias right yeah so the I guess what I want to say about this is just, uh, I mean, this pr pr specific parameterization is, uh, or uh, represent, yeah, parameterization, I guess I should say, demonstrates the power of hierarchical structures, right? Where we can represent parameters at scales such as the trial level, so we have inter-trial variability, which we can have parameters that are average across the entire experiment. We can have parameters that can vary within conditions, like so. We can have var parameters that um, varied across stimuli, so stimuli within conditions, and then can vary, so this is a random stimuli 
and if we had information about subjects here, so you imagine another block with subjects, you'd have a random cross here where we'd be hierarchically representing stimuli and subjects, so accounting for multiple sources of random variability and maximizing the potential generalizability of the representation of the parameters. Um, so this is like almost essentially the goal here for me where a part of my rationale for working through this book is being able to build up uh, enough um, expertise to specify my own drift diffusion model for the particular context I'm interested in. And so this is coming for circle uh, just demonstrating, okay, well, in my case, I want to have a hierarchical model um, of drift diffusion, um, specifically looking at um, how fatigue, um, uh, cognitive and physical fatigue, uh, change across uh, over time of an experiment. And I want to account for how subjects can vary within the experiment. Um, so this is sort of the whole package in a lot of ways, and I, I look forward to being able to do that moving forward. Um. Hmm. Last question. Develop a modified model that does not require you to truncate the rate scale when sampling alpha decay rate. Truncation is not only theoretically inelegant, but technically problematic. So this can be considered censoring rather than truncation. So it wants me to change the model. Just enough time. Okay, so first let me think about some ways to generate. You could do a uniform distribution. So if it's not clear what they're asking me, um, what they're saying is okay, this approach is not uh, significantly different from doing the censoring. So how can I truncate the distributions without So I guess the question is, how can you represent alpha and beta without doing that and also restrict them? Immediately, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to go look at the Gaussian process chapter.
Okay. So instead of doing this, let's do this. Distribution. I'm going to try a uniform distribution here for the precision. This way, I'm specifying um, Zero. Because I have running club soon. But here we go. Uniform priors here. Zero to eighteen. So equal probability across all values of retention is essentially what I'm saying there. And I'm just gonna take these off, these restrictions. And we'll see what happens. I'll do this and yeah. to lambda let's set it at zero beta lambda zero Error in node beta mu. So for the fourth subject, the third prediction seems to be doing something.
maybe Couchy. Like alpha distributor of the Couchy distribution. Unfortunately, out of time today. Yeah, because I have to get going. If I'm going to be late to my running club today. Yes, so that's where I got to. Essentially, uh, it looks like it's breaking here. Node prediction. Four third invalid parent value. Uh, something about See what happens if I put this back here before I start. Just to see if this fixes the problem. You see, it's still something. So I know the problem is with the uniform thing I set up. So notice, we look, it's subject four, it keeps breaking. The predictions for subject four are somehow, it's an error there. I bet if I do this. Yeah. Something going on with subject four, it looks like. All right, we'll stop there for today. Next time I'd like to start with signal detection theory, but um, I'm gonna think a little bit about this. And if I come up with an answer, I will, but I won't try to spend too much time on it because I'd like to keep moving to signal detection theory next time. Because we're gonna be working with a sort of binary discrimination problem, it looks like which is really up my alley based on what I've described up to this point. Um, talking about diffusion process earlier today. But that's it for today. Thanks. This was really fun today. I look forward to doing more examples that are essentialized around this problem that cog people who are part of the um, cognitive sciences are bound to approach um, when modeling data using um, theories from cognitive sciences and Bayesian inference. That's all for today. Thanks guys. Oh, have a good one.